just a reminder, this group abides by the W3C patent policy and only people and companies listed on the site are allowed to make substantive contributions to the specs. So welcome, uh, focus of this meeting, we'll talk a little bit about the face-to-face -face meeting in Stockholm, the agenda. Um, Dr. Alex and his team will provide an update on the status of KITE uh, and interoperability testing. And then we'll try to make progress on a few open issues in WebRTC. Um, and then our goal is, based on the resolution of those issues and PRs, to recycle WebRTC 1.0 at CR after the meeting uh, in time for the June face-to-face, -face, which we'll talk about in a minute. So uh, that meeting is scheduled for June 19th and 20th at the Google Stockholm offices. Um, you can, which you can find very easily on Google Maps. There are quite a few hotels nearby, so hopefully everybody who wants to make arrangements can. We will be doing remote uh, participation, which I think is very well supported by that facility and Google Hangouts. Um, we also have uh, a, we'll be meeting at TPAC in Lyon uh, on October 22nd and, and the 23rd, Monday and Tuesday. So that's our schedule of physical meetings, and of course, we'll continue the virtuals uh, on a roughly monthly basis. So a little bit about the virtual interim. I think you've seen a post on the proposed agenda. We're still working that through. So if you have uh, things you'd like to see addressed or comments on the interim, please send them. Um, but this is more or less the outline. I know Peter's provided some feedback, uh, but we'd love to have that from everyone. So we're going to start off the discussion with use cases, and the um, discussion has been going quite well on the mailing list, so please continue that. Um, and then after we do that, we'll talk a little bit about directional questions, just general uh, guidance of how we want to do things. Um, we're thinking of then talking a little bit about ICE and ways that that can be done, um, certificates and identity data transfer, and we're hoping that uh, Leonard uh, and Peter will um, develop and run that part of the agenda. And then from three to five on the first day, that'll be turned over to Dr. Alex and his team to talk about testing and interop. Um, and then the second day, uh, we have Harold talking about access to raw media. Um, Sergio would like to have a discussion on scalable video coding. I'll help you with that. Um, and then uh, talk a little bit more about send the receiver. Hopefully Peter uh, will cover that. And then uh, the topic of web workers we've assigned to Harold. And then we have two open slots which we can assign now or uh, leave them open and assign them during the meeting for topics that need follow up and then wrap up. So that's more or less the agenda. Feel free to comment on it or if there's other topics you'd like to discuss, uh, send them off to the mailing list and we'll continue working on this as time goes on. All right, a uh, little uh, public service reminder about the charter. Um, the, it is out for review, AC review, until May 25th. Um, we haven't gotten that much in the way of feedback or voting on it yet, um, but we'd like to make sure that all the AC reps respond. So um, if you're a member, and please, uh, please have a look at it and give us your vote uh, by May 25th. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So a little bit about this meeting. Um, presumably you're here, so you've figured out how to get here from the wiki. Um, we have published a link to the slides, so you can click on that if you want to look at them, uh, skip ahead or something. Um, we have the IRC channel. We do need a volunteer, I think, to scribe. Do we have one? Anyone interested in scribing? It's not a hugely uh, problem, difficult task. You just need to write down decisions we make. Um, I'll have to choose somebody if I don't have a hero volunteer. <laughs> uh, Bernard, I, I can scribe the second half of the meeting after after I talk. Okay, that that sounds good because we probably won't make. I suspect there won't be any decisions during the talk on kite, so. That should work well. Thank you. Okay, the meeting is being recorded. I guess, Vivian, you've turned that on. Um, so just so you all know, be on your good behavior. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, for discussion today, we'll have Dr. Alex talking about kites. Should uh, be about 45 minutes allocated to that. 
then we'll try to handle these uh, roughly half a dozen uh, updates to WebRTC PC, and that is the agenda uh, for today. So, uh, Dr. Alex, do you want to run your slides? Do you want me to run them for you? Um, if it's okay with you, you, I would prefer you to run them. Okay, I will do that. And uh, I will try to be faster. I don't think I need 45 minutes. I think I can uh, surrender some time to the, to okay. the, yeah, to the yeah, pull we request. Can, we can do uh, Q&A or whatever you'd like to do. Uh, but anyway, here we go. Uh, these are the slides that Dr. Alex was going to do in April before we ran out of time, unfortunately. So uh, turn it over to Dr. Alex. All right. Thanks, Bernard. Um, so basically, it's going to be an update with all the latest tests and capacity we had it to kite. Uh, the goal is uh, twofold. One, to make you aware of the tests we're already running every day. And two, to give uh, everybody the opportunity to point to things that we are not testing and we should. Um, so next slide, Bernard, please. So um, originally, the, the reason behind kind very quickly is that we were trying to complexify existing tech stack, right? Instead of separating, so people are trying to make WPT Selenium aware Try, people trying to make WPT test asymmetric and synchronized. So basically, we're trying to to do more with what we already have instead of trying with a different approach. So we decided to do kite, not to replace anything existing. I think the WPT is doing exactly what it should do, which is to test the API one by one, one browser at a time, but to address the specific problem of end-to-end uh, -end testing with uh, with the WebRTC API or browser to something else testing, as we're going to see in the simulcast, or multi-party testing, right, which is not something that is easily done by design with any other tool at that time. Next slide. Um, so what was the goal? P2P communication between two WebRTC-capable browsers with a loose definition of browser. It can be gateway, can be SFU, it can be something that is WebRTC compliant, right? which is a little bit different from the W3C goal, and that's why there is, a, there is a, a different test for that. Currently, most of the code is open source with a contribution from Google and Cosmo. We're looking forward to more people jumping in. Mozilla gave us a lot of uh, pointer to things that we should do. Valwoon has been reaching us to say, okay, we could do more on the network and start and things. We really uh, welcome that, and we would like to, to try to make it something that is more useful for people, but also uh, uh, contributed more by uh, people that have uh, an interest in it. Next slide. So um, there was a work that has been done on the web driver itself that is a little bit outside of the scope of WebRTC, but is very crucial to actually testing WebRTC itself. Uh, Apple has been doing the heavy lifting there and has proposed the, uh, implement, did the first implementation and, and uh, shipped it. Uh, maybe UN can give a little bit more details here if he wants. Uh, the idea is how do you handle in a unified way, which means in WebDriver, uh, managing the permission prompts, uh, the case where uh, the permission prompt for the camera is used as a proxy for network, as candidate, enumeration of devices, and so on, generating fake media on machines that might not have actual physical hardware to do so, and uh, secure and insecure origins. Uh, one or two years ago, when we started looking at that, every browser had a different way, if any, to actually handle each of these specific cases. There was a lot of discussion specifically on the permission side of things that went behind get user media, that involved web sockets, that involved uh, geolocation, Bluetooth, and all the 11 uh, APIs that are defined in the separate permission spec. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the Apple contribution was specific to get user media only, but the design was capable of an, uh, being extended to different kinds of permissions. So before I go to the next slide, Yuan, do you want to comment on, to comment on the work uh, you did? Uh, I think you did a good summary. So. Okay, great. Uh, next slide then. Um, what we did in the in the past month was to stabilize the browser conf browser and uh, operating system configuration we had in the past and add a few new 
one. Uh, we support most of the Firefox, Chrome, uh, Safari, and Edge desktop configuration there is, uh, including Safari Tech Preview and Edge uh, Fast Track. Uh, I, I never remember the name of those Edge distribution that are yeah, there. Windows are Insider Preview. Yes, that's the one, Bernard. The the one that gave me most work today, uh, <laughs> the most exciting ones. We also, uh, so that was pretty trivial behind uh, the engineering problem of making sure to keep the things up to date and the matching between the web driver binaries, the web driver bindings and, and, uh, and the browser binaries themselves. Uh, for people that are interested in, in the background, there's also some limitation in the number of copies of a, a given browser you can run with WebDriver. Namely, Edge and Safari are limited to one per operating system. So when you do an interoperability testing, you cannot always parallelize. You test against uh, Safari or Edge unless you actually have different physical machines which led to people that follow my tweets seeing pictures of me buying 20 Mac Mini to be able to, to run that thing in less than 14 hours a day. So one month ago, all those tests, all the interoperability tests were reaching the bar of 14 hours a day. What we had in internal configuration that was a little bit more difficult were the mobile and the electron configuration. So we added support for Chrome and Firefox on Android, as well as Safari uh, on iOS as part of the testing matrix to, to the daily runs. And uh, last week, we added support for Electron as well, since a lot of people wanted to, to do that. It's not shown. Electron results are not shown on webrtc.org, but they're shown on our public Cosmo dashboard, and people can go there and check it. Next slide. Um, one of the, the biggest problems was that most of the tests were uh, supposing a given backend. And while this is a normal approach where SIP or Flash, for example, where the signaling is also well defined, this is a little bit more challenging with WebRTC where anybody can implement their own signaling. And you still need a complete application with a minima signaling server to be able to handle the handshake and the discovery. So that was becoming a problem. So we did a design where uh, Kite does not suppose anything about the application and the test or the system and the test. So you can run any kind of client, again, different backend, production, non-production, staging, development, you can run it locally, and so on. All those cases are taken care of. Next, uh, next slide. So that, that's an overview, right? You have a, a JSON configuration that say, uh, I'd like Chrome 64 and Windows 10, please or I'd like all those browser configuration. Uh, you have an engine that is going to distribute that on a, on a Selenium grid. Uh, the nodes of the Selenium grid are actually going to run the test against the system and the test. In that case, the system and the test was GC Video Grid SFU for illustration only. And then we'll collect and aggregate the results to be sent back to whatever dashboard or command line you, you want to see it, right? So by separating using this orange line, the configuration, the dashboard, the, the grid, and the, the system and the test, we were able to actually crack the problem that otherwise was becoming difficult to, to handle. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an example of one application of Kite to the number of browser equal one use case. So we took the WPT that was uh, run on the right-hand side on four different configurations from time to time. And we show that we could run it on the 18 configuration that Kite support uh, automatically on a daily basis. And uh, that basically took one day of work on me. So that shows how you can take an existing test suite and basically you just have a little bit of glue to make to make it run on top of Kite which is going to separate the problem of running the test and having the browser configurations. So today there is a, a, a parallel uh, effort within the scope of WPT itself to try to make WPT Selenium aware. Uh, and that is, that is much slower than, than what we, we, we could achieve that way. So next slide. 
So this is another example of support for the stat integration. So if you look at the lower right hand drawing with the wheel, that's the result of all the one-to-one -one tests. And if you take a specific just, you know, ice connection test, you know, I'm just checking that the two browser can connect by checking that the ice connection status is changing to completed. If it's changed to completed on both browser, then the test is okay, otherwise it's failed. I can take a specific line, so you see the one that is uh, uh, chosen and is green, which is Android with Chrome 65 against Windows 10 uh, Edge 16. And if I click on the left-hand icon that looks like a, like a curve, right, I end up into the screen you see on the left, which is the parsing of all the stats all the SDP, all the offer answer in a way that is easier to understand than just by looking at the, at the string and, and trying to make sense of it. So uh, that has been added to the open source and it's, uh, it's available for everybody. I think it's going to make a, 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 a better tool to actually investigate the, the case that, that failed. Um, of course, support for stats is not exactly homogeneous across the browsers and the resolution, uh, but uh, we're going to push for, uh, for that. Next slide. So this is an example of GT Run. So this is an example of a case where you have three browsers participating. And it's just to show that uh, not only Kite can handle more than a one-to-one -one call, uh, given the right system and the test, but also the, the reason why we took the onion ring visualization instead of the grid is to be able to accommodate more onion rings, right? More and more browsers. Next slide. So the really new thing we started uh, the past two months was testing for multi-party, plan B, unified plan, multi-stream, and uh, simulcast, right? So multi-party, we use the GT test you saw before. There is no limit to the number of browser you can actually use in Kite. There are some limit in the browsers and there are some limit in the in the backend. I will not tell you what it is because I'm sure everybody wants to have the joy to break that thing down by themselves and uh, see how, how much how, how many peer connection they, they can raise. Multi-stream was not too difficult to go there. Uh, we decided to test against unified plan and not to test against plan B. And Google is currently using these to uh, help fasten uh, the support of a unified plan. So a little bit more in the next slide. The simulcast was a little bit more, uh, no, no, wait, wait, wait. Wait a minute. Simulcast was a little bit more difficult in the sense that um, in WebRTC.10, simulcast is only defined on the sender side. So you need to send from a browser to an SFU. And the logic for switching between the layers is not standardized, it's not defined anywhere. So we reach out to uh, GC, to Janus, to uh, Currento, to a few of the WebRTC uh, media server to see how they did that. And the logic they implemented is actually very use case dependent, right? Some people let the receiver client decide when to switch the layer. Some people let the SFU actually decide when to do that. And the triggers, the threshold themselves are, are different from one case to the other. So what we decided to implement and to make available was some kind of a loopback test where the sender application is sending simulcast stream to the to an SFU, which return one of the one of the layer. And the application can then choose between the layer and check that you can switch between one of the uh, and the other, uh, validating that uh, implicitly you receiving the good stream information about which one is high resolution and low resolution and you can switch between them. Right now, it's only implemented against the Medus SFU because we were more familiar with the code, but we plan to extend it to at least Genus and Currento. And anybody that actually wants to have a test for their own SFU is welcome to contribute as long as the, they make the source code available so the test is standalone and can be run. So next slide, specific on multi-stream. Um, it's running locally. 
Uh, we tried both with and without adapter.js to see if adapter.js is actually helping, uh, taking care of the unified plan for browsers that do not support it natively. Um, and we, what we test exactly is that the SDP that are generated are compliant with the, with the format on the sender side, that on the SFU side, the IDs on the wire are uh, mapping the IDs that were received on the signaling path, and that eventually the media is flowing, right? So it's not, I mean, we could test a lot of things, but we decided that those were free conditions that must be tested and would be enough to uh, actually have a good quality. We expect people to report problem if the test is not sufficient for a given use case and to be able to extend the case uh, in the future. So the result as of last meeting, Firefox was working as expected with or without adapter.js. Good work, guys. Firefox was kind of our reference client there since they were the first one to implement Unified Plan. Chrome still had some errors and the support for Unified Plan was supposedly available behind some flags that were not working. So Google was very happy and they knew what to fix. I didn't look at the latest results, but I believe this has improved since. Uh, next slide. Simulcast, so we developed a specific application that would connect to an SFU and then uh, receive back uh, one of the layer and, and trigger. We made the codes uh, available and we also hosting the application to be able to test. Um, and that's exactly what I told you before, so I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, here again, it works as expected on Firefox, uh, but it looks like the simulcast uh, SDP format is not exactly up to date. Um, we didn't we didn't change it to a lean and mean compliance uh, mode. So we for us the Firefox test is uh, is working, and we have communicated to uh, the, the the Mozilla team uh, that point. Uh, in the in the past two months, I think we discovered 30 or 40 bugs in you know all the browser across, including web driver implementation and so on. And we have uh, filled up tickets with all the group uh, as we were going. Our hope is that uh, Kite will be able to to help discovering uh, bugs that would otherwise go unnoticed. Next slide. Um, we have developed a loads and infrastructure testing mode. Uh, as opposed to the interoperability testing mode we had so far. And the idea was to um, add a cron-like time frequency notification in the configuration file. Um, so for the most interesting is the bottom one. If you want to add one cron 53 on Windows 10 every 20 seconds to connect against your server, this is the notation you're going to use. So you recognize the browser configuration notation, which is browser, browser revision, operating system, operating system revision. And now you have a time frequency notation at the beginning that is that looks like cron on Linux, and a quantity, the number of browsers at the end. And uh, with that extension, it's very easy to do load testing. In a video conferencing use case, it's not that useful because you saturate very quickly your server with, let's say, 30 participants. Um, but if you do streaming or one too many, send only, receive only, all those cases, uh, we were able to reach uh, around half a million viewers nowadays on, on streaming only infrastructure uh, using uh, that approach. So I think uh, it was interesting to let people know that was uh, existing. We preparing uh, a paper with uh, GC, Janus and the other guys. Uh, for IPTCOM a little bit later this year with, with some data and some comparative results since both uh, GT and uh, Janus had developed load testing tools that unfortunately were specific to their implementation, respectively the GT Hammer and uh, Jatak, uh, while this approach would be able to test absolutely any system and compare them actually in a, in a way that is fair. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, the, the biggest problem of Kite so far was uh, how to set up the grid. 
we set up the grid manually and we maintain it. We were setting it up manually and we were maintaining it manually, which was proven to be difficult and very time consuming. And when Kite runs, Kite assumed that the grid is available with all the machine it will ever need. Um, so that was not very user friendly. You know, if you had to reproduce and manually set up the grid yourself, there is a lot of black magic you had to know. Uh, and that was just not practical. And for load testing, you will not going to keep one million nodes around to do the load testing. So we needed to have something a bit smarter to not only help to set up the Selenium grid specifically for with web RTC setting for people that never done that before, but also to automatically on the fly and on demand uh, um, add nodes uh, when you were doing load testing. One thing that we wanted to do, and we uh, actually trying to collaborate with uh, with Colstat.io there, is to have network instrumentation to be able to test uh, the algorithm that manage the bandwidth estimation, the congestion control, the bit rate adaptation, uh, and uh, all those m coupling between the encoder and, and the network that is done through RTP and RTCP. Um, that's for the bandwidth fluctuation and, of course, network quality, jitter, packet loss, and things like that. Uh, Rhino, our, our tests uh, do not allow us to, to check or verify the ramping up behavior or any of those things. So that's coming as well, one way or another, but it's not in the code yet. Next slide. That might be it. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. So, um, so if I had to wrap it up, um, we extended the number of configuration we can test nowadays, right? Up to 21 if you count Electron and the mobile that we just added. We um, try to push WebDriver to make testing of WebRTC easier across. It's in progress. Uh, we added a lot of tests to be able to test the latest corner of the WebRTC 1.0 specification, namely multi-party, multi-stream, and simulcast. I think at this stage we have tests for almost everything. And uh, we have ongoing uh, development to make Kite more usable uh, for everybody that do not have a PhD or didn't read uh, 20 specs uh, in the last weeks. Right? Here you go. Um, do we have any questions for Dr. Alex from the group? So can you mention which uh, licenses your software are an, is under? Um, most of this, uh, most of the IP of everything I presented belong to Google, and uh, I understand you realize it, you release it under a very permissive license. I I don't remember exactly the name of it, but I think it's the same license as, as LibreVRTC, correct? I think it's the uh, either Apache or BSD. Yeah, probably Apache. Yeah. The point is, it's it's freely available. Yes. Um, Alex, um, just to, to note that WPT is trying nowadays to um, check whether when there's an issue, whether it's shared by all browsers or whether it's just an issue with one browser. Um, this way, they are trying to prioritize uh, interop issues based on on that, uh, are you able to detect issues that will be solely targeted, targeting one browser or multi-browser or things like that, or is it too difficult to do that? No, no, running the WPT is absolutely trivial uh, for us because it's one browser at a time. Yeah, I so with Kite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm speaking in the context of Kite. It, it will be trivial, but there is still the disagreement with our sponsor on what should be the best way. Uh, and uh, right now, our sponsor believes that the best way is not to use Kite for the WPT, so we respectfully uh, did not do that. Yeah, I, I was meaning, have you identified issues like with all browsers are 
not behaving correctly or just one browser is behaving correctly. Did you have that information by doing in the in, in the interrupt testing? Yes, we did. Uh, more than in the single uh, in the single API testing. Uh, and the reason being, we run the interrupt testing every day. We run the WPT three times. Hmm. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Dr. Alex? I, I guess there was a sub question there about when there's an interrupt problem, how do you identify which browser it is or stuff like that? Well, uh, it's not symmetric, right? So we run both sides and, uh, and then we do manual tests, right? So when we see something failing, we extract it. We have a daily analysis of the bug. We have one guy full time that does only that, and his job is to actually pinpoint uh, where the, the mismatch is. So once we have detected the mismatch, because that's what interrupt is, uh, we go back to read the spec and we check which one is not doing what is in the spec. So uh, NAM is the one running the test and the analysis. So RS, who wrote all the, the tests for the specs and know the, uh, the specs a little bit better, is the one that is checking uh, on which side we should write a ticket. So eventually, we try to connect with the team first to validate with them and ask them if they prefer us to put a ticket or you know, do it between us. Well, thanks. Any other questions for Dr. Alex? Have you been able to test uh, get contributing sources? Not that I know of. Okay. I can double check and come back to you. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I think the question there, Dr. Alex, right, is you need a mixer, and many of the SFUs aren't mixing, right? I don't know if that was the question. Uh, G, was that the question? I, I think that's a yeah, get contributing sources is particularly hard to test, yes, because it's only used by mixers, and I believe Google Meet uses it for a slightly different purpose. Yeah, uh, the SFUs just forward, essentially they forward Opus, so you wouldn't see the contributing sources. Uh, the, the, the media server we use has an SFU mode and an MCU mode, so we could do that. Uh, okay. What, what I propose uh, you do is like Niels did, like if we want to see something tested that is not, open a ticket, uh, you know, and then we go and we write the test. All right, sounds good. Thanks. Um, yeah, I do have uh, one question, Dr. Alex. It is outside the WebRC 1.0 spec, but it is implemented widely, which is support for scalable video coding, you know, the control of the uh, temporal scalability encoding. Um, any, any thoughts about that? Um, the, the server we used uh, can support VP9 SVC against the current implementation in Chrome. So we can, uh, switching the layer has been implementing as well. So we could repurpose the, the, the simulcast test we have to make an SVC test. But the thing is, there is only one implementation out there, right? So we thought we would wait until someone come up and say, oh, you know, I have another use case with SVC we would like to test or until another browser supports VP9 SVC, in which case we would do not only uh, 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 one, well, in WebRTC 1.0, you don't go browser to browser, but we, that would make it uh, uh, interesting enough for us to call. Do you have a specific use case in mind, Bernard? Uh, well, uh, we have an SDK that can generate uh, VP9 SVC uh, and VP8 SVC. Right, see. Um, so, uh, and I'm, we have not tested interoperability with other browsers, but uh, it might be interesting to be able to do Right. That. So I tell you one, Bernard, you, you know I'm in uh, Los Angeles right now. I'm supposed to fly to Seattle sometime during the next seven days. I don't know oh, which day. Okay. And I would have almost the entire day free. Do you want me to stop by? That would be wonderful. All right. I'll let you know the day I go there. Then. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. Alex? 
All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and just as a reminder, we will be covering testing and interop at the physical face-to-face -face in June in Stockholm. So uh, that will be another opportunity for people to uh, ask questions and, about, and uh, deal with testing. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to go back to uh, discussing WebRTC issues. We've got about half a dozen of those for today. Um, so that's what we're going to cover in the agenda going forward. Um, so uh, is Adam on the call? Uh, yes, I am. First issue is 1834. We can, I can yeah, hear you. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was a bit late. I, setting an alarm but uh, okay uh, 1834 should I go ahead with that one go ahead okay so uh, the bug is about uh, checking uh, the, the structure that we feed into set parameters uh, we currently do uh, some testing of this scale resolution down by so if if someone is entering a number that's uh, less than one, we throw range error. But um, there, there's some, there's a bug about uh, shouldn't we should do uh, more checking in this in this function. And and uh, looking at the, what we have as a bug, and what we have is like we don't really use unsigned types uh, consistently. Uh, we don't use any unsigned double in the entire spec. I don't know if there's a, some kind of web IL hidden rule about that. Uh, Yaliva, can you, do you have any comments on unsigned double? Yeah, I think I read somewhere that um, even though web IDL uh, has as its roots, it's an IDL language with lots of types. In practice, um, you know, the current only use of it is for JavaScript, and it, the preferred JavaScript yeah. types, I think, are Double and a few others, like yeah. that, and uh, long. Uh, I I can find. Oh, yeah. that, but, so, um, okay, so it doesn't really make sense. Well, uh, oh. there's I guess there's other annotation you can do to add ranges and stuff like that. That would uh, yeah. because simply uh, simply making a type unsigned would not cause it to throw error for negative values, I understand. Mm. Does it? Yeah. OK. So uh, uh, if you just provide, if you just provide, make it unsigned, then it will have very interesting behavior for uh, negative values. Right. It will ru run a mod function on it. Basically. Right. <laughs> and All right. So if, if so, you if you add unsigned clamp, it will actually make more sense. Then uh, it will uh, just clamp negative values to zero. I believe. So, so the question is, if we want to like, add add something in Web IDL to prevent negative values for for a lot of these, or if we just want to just explain something in text. Or we uh, can put uh, in language in procedure that says if it's negative, throw. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was right what I was trying to say with the second one. So, uh, so I, and obviously, we don't need to check the upper boundary of max values, because someone is kind of hinting that, OK, not, not more than this. And, and then you can, if you say a very big value, it's pretty much unconstrained. So, so the question is, should we check the low, lower boundary of, for example, max frame rate? Because if someone sets a very low I mean, the word max implies that, OK, not, not more than this. <laughs> and if someone sets a very, very low value, it could kind of make problems for the encoder and, and stuff. Uh, but it, it may not be super obvious what the lower boundary is. I, I guess that's the tricky part. So, uh, yeah. you, so can for, yeah. you can easily imagine an application that where a max frame rate of uh, one, once every 10 minutes makes sense. Mm. So, uh, whether it would work is a completely different question. 
Now, Adam, uh, it's like a over like a what do you call it a secure surveillance camera or something. Yeah. Then it might be very low frame rate. It's okay to save stuff. Yeah, traffic camera. Exactly. So I guess it, the problem is the same for for these uh, max frame rate and, and max bit rates. Do we need a lower boundary? And if we do that, that how do we get hold of it? I mean, that's. Uh, is it, um, Adam, is the working group decision that you're looking for whether we should do this only for set parameters or for all methods in the spec or uh, what the values are or how to do it? Or, oh. I mean, I mean these these uh, are members of the dictionary fed to set parameters. So for this the scope of this issue, it's only set parameters. But I don't know. Consistency is good, of course. So the, I mean, the, the the option is that we, that we let someone set some, something a max bit rate, and we need to explain that okay, you're just this is just a hint. But the word max kind of kind of points in the direction that this is, will be not more than this. So it will fail somehow otherwise. Well, I, I'm on. I'm all for uh, adding uh, checks on API to make it as specific as possible. And I'm also all for using WebIDL whenever possible to describe that. And I yeah. know there's like uh, extended attributes like enforce range that we could use. I don't know if they apply to dictionaries. It's the only thing. I'd have to check that. Yeah. yeah I mean, I mean and, and the thing with P time is like, but that is, is actually specified in, in pros to, to, to respect max P time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think I don't know if we need to do anything there, but some of it should should I uh, invest some time in trying to investigate in the lower boundaries of, of these max max properties? Yeah, I would say yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think any time invested here would be saved. You're, you're saving implementers time. So. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, we have to figure out what to do. Right. That's why we have a spec. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I I don't have a an answer for you. Okay. How to do it today, but uh, I just wanted to see if people right. what people thought about it before okay. investing the time. Thank I'll, you, Adam. I'll try to find a link about the 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 type thing, unsigned, and double and all that stuff. Okay. Okay, uh, next one is 1839. Do we have Taylor? Yeah, actually, I didn't know how to sign this. Um, you you wrote the uh, proposed answer, so I thought it, you might as well talk about it. Okay. Um, I can show you, uh, can you, I haven't seen this slide until right now. Can someone else, can you yeah. get the content? Actually, Harold, maybe you can introduce it. So let me say 1839. Yeah. Yeah, that was a that that, that was a, a simple implementation problem. Uh, so uh, we, when you we, bef before you negotiate something, uh, what the I mean, uh, when before you have negotiated uh, negotiated uh, codex, uh, you have senders, and so you have a codex members on the member on the sender. But uh, what should it return? The current text uh, se seems to indicate that it should be empty, and uh, the and and if if it isn't. Uh, and uh, that can that seems a bit odd. I mean, you can use uh, if it says that this is, these are the codecs you can expect to be expect to use because you know they're going to work. Then uh, it's reasonable to have them empty before negotiation. If it's uh, these are the codecs you might want to want to set, that's. Uh, 
that doesn't make sense. Mm. And if you want to use get parameters and then then set parameters to indicate use these codecs, then doesn't that doesn't make sense. But on the other hand, you don't know the the, the payload types for the codecs before you the negotiation, which is one of the parameters. Mm -hmm. So now I found I I wanted to write, write Ask the question. We should we should at least have have a clear idea of what we want to do. Yeah. So Taylor's answer to this, which I'm putting in as the proposed answer, is it is intentional and reasonable. Um, and the logic is on the slide. I don't know if you want to comment, Taylor. Yeah. I mean, so basically, the only reason for Git parameters returning the codex list is so that you can you know, read the payload type of the one. Uh, you want to use and set that in RTP encoding parameters. So until there's a payload type, it's, it's not really useful to have them returned. Um, I'd argue. Yep. Right, and, so, and the capabilities are in get capabilities, so you can get that there. Mm -hmm. So let me put it this way. Are there any objections to this proposed answer? Okay, so I think I think you have the answer to your question, Harold. Yep. So uh, should we, should we ask 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 for text to be really really obvious about this? Uh, I think that would be good. Yep. Okay. So those uh, taking notes, please uh, indicate that the proposed resolution in 1939 seems uh, amenable to the group, and uh, a PR should be. be should be uh, developed based on that. Okay, our next one is 1840, which is a similar question, but for receiver.get parameters. Um, and so uh, here's what section 5.1 says in terms of the text. Uh, it says, uh, so a couple of things. Um, uh, Jan Iver has clarified the parameters for receiving versus sending. Um, so you'll notice in the spec, uh, it's now much more clear about that. Um, and the receive parameters dictionary returned by get parameters uh, really has very little in it. In fact, the only thing in it is the RID attribute. Um, and then it states in 5.3 that, uh, so the, it turns the encodings um, with the RID popula uh, populated based on the current remote description. And whether, it says whether the media is actively being decoded or not. And then you also have header extensions and codecs. Um, but the issue is that if you look at the uh, encodings for the receiver side, the active attribute isn't there anymore. Um, we removed it because we didn't think it had any use. Um, so I don't know what the red text is for. Uh, and my proposal would be to delete it because um, I don't understand why it's there. Um, the other question is similar to the one Harold just asked about uh, sender.get parameters, um, which is in this case of the receiver, is the header extensions and codecs populated prior to completion of negotiation um, or only after? Um, in this case, my sense um, is that it might be populated before because once you have an offer like you call set local description, uh, you know what you're expecting to receive. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that would make sense to me. Oh, do you know? Do you know which read you you expect to receive? Well, that, that's the next one, Harold. I I don't un personally understand why the read is even in there, but we'll get to that in the next issue. The answer is you wouldn't know what read until you have the remote description, but I don't even know why we care about the read even then. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but does this, so, uh, you know, Harold talked about clarifying the text for the sender side. Um, I guess in this case, it was a clarification probably needed. Is it needed, do you think? Um, and also the other question is, should we get rid of the red text or not? Um, so I don't think it matters whether the media is actively being decoded, and I don't even know how to indicate that. I think that that's definitely referring to the active field, so we should get rid of that. Okay. Okay. 
So I'm guessing that. Sorry, can people hear me? Yes. Sorry, I had to rejoin. So I'm guessing the old text, there was some, uh, we removed it because we're not really receiving simulcast. Is that right? No, I think we removed it because there was no way to set the active attribute. Right. Right. Um, so it, it wasn't clear why it was there, what we were going to do with it. Uh, I, we we had talked about using active with respect to direction, but we went we used set direction and you know all that stuff instead. So it's the active attribute for the receiver seemed vestigial, so that's why we we took it out. The simulcast thing I'll talk about in the next issue. Um, all right. Okay. So I think um, for the notes, I think the general direction proposed here in 1840 seems amenable, and we should try to develop a PR for that. Okay, so here's the next one, 1852. So this is where we get into the reception of simulcast. So in section 5.1, it says uh, that we don't define how to configure, create, offer to receive uh, simulcast, but conceivably an SFU could send an offer to a browser with some, you know, the SFU is gonna send simulcast to the browser, and then when you call set remote description, um, those that would somehow be reflected in what you get out of receiver docket parameters. That's what the text says. But there's a couple of questions about this. One is whether we expect any browser to actually implement this. So do we really expect browsers to receive simulcast and do something to make that happen? So that's a question. But the second question is even if we do, um, the only thing that's in the RTP decoding parameters is currently the RID. So what you get is you retrieve these encodings with only the RID attribute. So you wouldn't have anything else. There'd be no SSRCs, no payload types, just the RID. Um, and so my question is, why is this useful? Um, since there's nothing else, if the app really wanted to do anything with this info, it would need to parse the STP anyway. Um, and uh, presumably, since some browsers won't implement reception of simulcast, um, and the RID attribute currently isn't noted as required, uh, I guess the RID attribute wouldn't be there uh, in at least some browsers, in which case we're basically returning this empty dictionary, which doesn't seem terribly useful. Um, so what do people think of this? Is there, does it make any sense to have a RID attribute in RTP coding parameters and, and decoding parameters? And if so, what is it, what would anybody use it for? Well, does anyone remember the original use case that led it to get into the spec in the first place? Well, I think it's the use case in section 5.1, which is a brow, uh, an SFU sending an offer of simulcast to a browser. I mean, we're still not, I mean, assuming that, I mean, there's se separable questions. One is whether we should have that language in there at all. Uh, but I think Cullen wanted to have it in there um, just in case somebody wanted to implement it. So the first question is, is anybody actually going to do what Section 5.1 says? I mean. So the, the, the nice thing about this is that you can discover that someone's sending you a simulcast. That's the only, if you, if you support receiving of simulcast, then the only way you can discover whether someone is sending you simulcast or not is by by looking at the receive. Apart from SDP parsing, of course, is by looking at the receiver's uh, um, decoding parameters. Right. Yeah. So if you see I mean, if, if uh, you see this RID being uh, set. You could conclude you're getting simulcast, is what you're saying. Yeah, if you, if you see that the sequence has, has more than one member, you can assume that you're getting simulcast. Mm. Yeah, you wouldn't get any information about it. You still have to parse the SDP to do that, but you could. It would give you that. Yeah, I mean, if 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 there's a use case for knowing mm. more information about it, we should add more information. But uh, if if there's a use case for knowing that you're receiving simulcast, then uh, then we we need to have decoding parameters that right. uh, so that you you know from the length of the sequence how many simulcast layers you're receiving. Well, I, either one or none. 
Yes. I had one, one more. Harold, having implemented reception of simulcast, the first thing I would do if I knew I was receiving it would be to try to figure out the stats because in our experience, it's incredibly problematic and very bad things happen when you do that. <laughs> so you're very likely to see all kinds of like horrible things happen like lost packets, delays, blah, 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 blah. Um, so I, I, you know, I'd question whether we have all the stats necessary to diagnose something like this. It's not something you do casually. It, it's a lot oh, of complexity it, for potentially some bad outcomes. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, yeah, the, I mean, the, the first thing you would do when you di discover you're receiving simulcast is to try to turn it off. Right? <laughs> exactly, that would be the thing. Is like it's an error condition. Make it stop. Right. Yeah, and the stats and the stats currently don't have uh, anything that uh, don't have reasonable numbers to give give you back for simulcast layers. Yeah, uh, if different, different RTP streams, you will get you will get them. Yeah, I mean, among other things, right? If you don't have the right um, NTP alignment, because what will happen is you'll have different sequence numbers that you'll have to align internally within your RTP stack. So a lot of really ugly things can happen. Like you can get confused about reordering and put things in the pipeline. So what I heard is that the use case then is for receiver get parameters is to know that you got an offer with final cast in it so that you can check encoding's length and then throw an error. But it's, well, that brings a side question though. Is receiver get parameters Will that return the most current thing if I in have remote uh, offer? Uh, well, it, 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 I don't know about the most current thing, but it should, if you read what it says in 5.1, it, it, it basically should reflect the last set remote description. Right. Only in this respect, right? It's only going to give you the RID. It's not going to give you anything else that was in the remote description. Okay. So I think what Harold said is the only thing this can be used for. And basically, when you get this, it, it'll tell you that, yes, I have a browser that supports this, and I've set it up for simulcast. And then probably you ought to panic and say, how do I make this go away? Yeah. The, the only other use case I can think of at the moment is uh, is in uh, in testing, where you now no longer need an SFU to to discover that, uh, that yes, uh, your process Procedure for setting up simulcast is actually actually generates something that looks like simulcast. Yeah, I mean that would be a savings from the testing point of view. You could <laughs> browser to browser without an SFU. That's probably the best use case we've come up with so far, Harold. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean you could you you could uh, talk to yourself like most of the tests. Do. Although you know the problem is if it didn't work, um, yeah, to make that actual test actually succeed would be a huge amount of, uh, and work well, would be a huge amount of work on the browser for, frankly, not that much benefit. But. Yeah. I mean, uh, and, and uh, another po possibility is to go, go into 5.1 5 and say, say if, if, you re if you receive simulcast, then throw an error. Yeah. I mean, no. um, if you really wanted to make simulcast work, there's actually a lot of, uh, stuff that you have to do in the RTP stack to really make that function correctly, and it is definitely non-trivial. Um. All right, I have a side question here. Um, so these are negotiated parameters, right? Uh, so, and get parameters says this method returns the RT the receiver object's current parameters for how track is decoded. Right. Now the word current there is that based on Current remote description or pending remote description? I, I would assume it's current, not pending. But so then you would have to wait for a set local answer then before you could read the, the parent get, call get parameters. Um, sure. OK. Does that make sense, Taylor? Uh, just on the previous slide, we decided it would return things even if you only apply a local offer that you're already prepared to receive. 
Uh, yeah. Um, I meant that portion of it. I, uh, I think um, Jan Ebert was asking about the RID. Well, I mean, I'm asking about get parameters in, in total. It says current parameters in the spec text, and maybe it needs to clarify since we have both pending and current remote descriptions. Yeah, I, I was assuming that it, uh, it, it, you would get something just after SLD. You would get some portions of the spec. The RID thing is unique, well, right, because it's – uh, you, you're only going to get this is only going to be turned on if you had it, it in the offer and called set remote description. So that portion would only show up then. Well, if you call, would it would it show up and have remote offer or would it show up in stable? Mm. Right. I think as written, it would show up in stable, and that's what we right. wanted. To, that's kind of what I was assuming. If we wanted to work differently, we'd have to change the text. I think. Yeah, I guess my bigger question is, uh, my first question is, why do we, why do we even have? I mean, based on, should we keep this RID thing in there? I mean, Harold's suggestion was it's, it tells you if your browser supports um, reception of simulcast, but do we have any browsers that are actually intending to implement that? Well, I, I thought Harold had a good point that I don't think it depends on that. I mean, it's it's use even if we have no browsers that implement it. Uh, it's the way to detect that you got an offer, a simulcast offer without parsing the SDP, which I guess has some value. But if, you, but if you don't support it, you shouldn't you shouldn't have the RID attribute set. Well, yeah, because the register would not include the RIDs. Right. Yeah. So my question is whether anybody is really intending to implement this or not. That's my first question. Well, it's really a question for you, Yanni, but I don't think Chrome or Edge is, or Safari is interested in. Oh no, I don't think we're interested in supporting that. Oh okay. Um, I mean, I I don't know. I don't speak for Colin or, uh, and I think he's the one who may have indicated you said to support some interest. Well, he was interested in it, I think, um, but. So. And, uh, you know, I, so I don't know for sure uh, for Mozilla either, um, but I don't, no, uh, no, no, we don't have any interest in re receiving simulcast. Okay. So maybe, uh, Harold, is the next step maybe to ask for consensus on the working group list since we don't have anybody indicating they care about this? Well, uh, ask for consensus to delete 5.0, 5.1? Uh, well, I think, well, I would say it's delete the RID thing, but also if nothing is returned by, is there anything, if we deleted the RID, is there anything left to do usefully with receiver.get parameters? Well, yeah, you can still test the length of the array. But it wouldn't have any, so you'd still have an array with empty stuff in it, I guess? Yeah, with empty objects. But what would that tell you? It would tell if you received uh, simulcast or not. If, if the re remote offer had simulcast in it. Well, but if nobody's planning to support that, would it even tell you that? Well, so that's um, the way it's written. I know that for uh, ad transceiver, we added language recently to limit um, encodings based on what the user agent supports. But I think in the case that, of- That was on the sender, right? Right. So in the case of a, a remote offer, it wouldn't be limited. It would just show you what was in the offer, right? Well, that's the problem mm -hmm. is we removed all the attributes, so it doesn't really do that anymore. Let me see. Get parameters uh, returns. Uh... Yeah, it says encodings is populated based on reads present in the current remote description and right, whether right. it is actively being decoded or not. So, yeah. so, uh, so, so, so the get parameters call returns header extensions, RTCP, and codec, codecs. Right, that part it does, right. But yeah. the encodings part is semi-useless. So um, anyway, we can, we can ask if anybody cares about the RID attribute. Um, and uh, so we, uh, get, get rid of it. If nobody cares about it, get rid of it out of the Yankee uh, de uh, decoding parameters dictionary. Okay, I think we have uh, what to do with 1852. 
All right. Uh, so 1858, Taylor. All right. So basically, just due to limitations of the bundle spec, an answer can't reject the offer bundle tag section, or it's the one that appears first in the bundle group. If you have a pre-existing bundle group, like from a previous offer answer, or if the offer was using A equals bundle only. So what happens if you, you know, if in between the offer and answer, the answer calls transceiver.stop and then create answer, you know, should it um, reject both, or, you know, all, all bundled M sections just because um, it has to? which, you know, that may be surprising because you stop one transceiver, but then all of them end up stopped, which wasn't what you wanted. Um, or should it uh, create an answer with that M section still not rejected with uh, a direction of an active instead and then uh, reject it in a subsequent offer? That would be triggered by on negotiation needed firing right after that remote description. I guess my suggestion would be the, the latter, um, although, you know, it assumes that you're uh, relying on, on negotiation needed. Uh, uh, now I wish we could. Hmm? This should be in the bundle spec. Hmm. Sorry, what should be in the bundle spec? Um, uh, if you if the answer rejects the first M section, then uh, the, the the bundle spec should should uh, should say exactly what should happen. Well, it, it does. It says you can't do that. You have to either not reject it or reject all of them. So, which one should our GC do? I think we should reject all of them. You asked for it. You got it. Okay, but it's also that you asked for something, but then you're getting a little more. So, yep. um, but that that would indeed think is simplest. Yep. I mean, if, if we if we have chosen to make the bundle spec so that it's impossible to reject a, reject one one of them M lines, then we should just respect that. So just so I understand then, there's no way from the JavaScript to know whether bundle is used, is that right? So you yeah. yeah, you you could see that the DTLS transport on both of the RT vendors or RT receiver is the same. Right. Okay. Because it's a bit surprising, I guess, you stop a transceiver and other transceivers stop as well. Yeah. Which I guess means you need to be safe. You just only do that before the free offer instead of before free answer. I mean, part, part of the, the point of the API was to uh, reject it between offer and answer. I hate to say it. Does this mean the stop method is on the wrong object? Huh? No. No? No, it, mean, it means that. Uh, uh, it means that due to, due to the stupid way uh, STP is structured, uh, uh, actions have side effects. Right. Ugly just like too. just like the just like the fact that uh, when we stop it that the that when we stop a transceiver, both the sender and receiver are stopped. Mm. It's uh, I mean, right. when we show we, as long as we have swallowed that camel, we we should swallow that camel. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't fully understand the alternative. Right. But I don't think. Do you want me to explain it again? Mm. Mm. So. Uh. In, so in, instead of creating an answer with everything rejected, it would create an answer with everything not rejected. Um, with the, the section that you wanted to reject just being inactive, and then it would immediately fire 
on negotiation needed again. And so the answer would, and you know, become the offer, and uh, do a new offer answer exchange. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Um, is that how it works? Doesn't that what happens to the? I'm saying that's how it could work. Because you're in stable state then. Yeah, then, stable still negotiation is. But then stop like, and stop. Um, I want to stop this transceiver, but I had to do another offer answer in order to do it. It would be you know, yeah. similar to saying a direction to a value that requires I, I, yeah. an offer answer. I, I think that's going to really complicate the nature of stop. Um. Yes. So, so the bundle spec uh, allows uh, about allow, allows both options. Mm. So, I so I suggest that we keep keep it as keep the less complex uh, pick the less complex complex option am, among the bad ones, and uh, and uh, read. Reject the bundle infections. Hmm. Each bundle infection. Now, slight secondary question then: Would the transceivers, the other transceivers, appear as stopped immediately, or only after you call set local description with the answer? I guess maybe we can work I, that out. In a I comment. think they should. I, I think they should be. Should be stopped when you do the set, set local description of the answer. Right. Otherwise, it's pretty damn weird. Yep. All right. It's uh, still weird, but a little less weird. <laughs> yep. Answer calls. Um. Actually, I'm just thinking if there are any other implications of this held. Because usually we say when you call stop, right, you're not generating events on something you call. But if you're generating weird side effects. Um, but we're saying the weird side effects would happen later on several descriptions for that. Yeah, so you would get the events, right, because you wouldn't expect them necessarily. Uh, yeah. yeah, you would. Yeah, yeah. okay, good. You, you, you will get stopped events for the for transceivers that are stopped because of as a side effect of as your side effect of generating an, generating an answer and uh, setting a local description on that based on yeah the total state of the system. Right. Okay. All and right. if you can get away with not doing JSON changes, that would be good. Okay. So general direction on 1858 is to take the suggestion and uh, PR, I guess, coming from Taylor and Harold. Specifically, the first suggestion to just reject right. every Okay. Oops, sorry. Uh, all right. So now I think we're at uh, 1872, Harold. So it is 1872. Let me get that. Uh, it's uh, uh, how many is encodings can we send? And it turned turned out when uh, Jan Eva pointed out that uh, Bernard had already fixed uh, this for uh, for most cases that it. It it reduced to only one interesting case, which was: uh, should it be possible to to go from being a simulcast sender and with be, being non-simulcast, that is sending only one encoding, to having multiple encodings after you create the transceiver, or does the creating the transceiver lock in the number of uh, simulcast encodings? Mm. And uh, what I what I suggested was that uh, in in the in the bank was that we could uh, could let the uh, let uh, the number of simulcast encodings be 
set up to the maximum supported by the by the implementation and the current state of negotiation by saying that uh, that uh, the capabilities would return the maximum number of supported encodings at all times mm. but only activate one of them now if we're if the group is of the opinion that we should lock in the whether whether we're sending simulcast or unicast at the beginning when we create the transceiver, then uh, I should just close this bug and say we're fine with uh, we're fine with the text that is. So working group, what do we want, and when do we want it? Uh, from my reading of the spec. It, it, I always assumed that uh, you only got simulcast if you asked for it would send encodings on that transceiver. Yeah, that was my impression. And I worry that if we always returned, uh, it, it, I worried if get parameters always return multiple encodings, it might confuse people who never thought about simulcast. Yeah, so hiding the simulcast capability until people explicitly ask for it sounds like a good idea. Good idea. Right. And it should be harmless because if you ask for it and you get back one, you know that it didn't support it. And if if you got back more, you could set active to false. Okay. I guess the only option would be if there was a way in send encodings to say add this layer but default it to false. Mm, which there isn't right now. Oh, the, yes, there is. Okay. You just set, set active to false. Okay. Okay. So that way you can have can set up a couple of layers and uh, and activate them activate right, them activate if needed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then we can close this. Okay. Good. All right. So I think we've gotten through everything um, and finally got to the bird for the first time in our virtual interim history. <laughs> um, so uh, unless there's anything else, uh, we want to thanks thank uh, MIT for the WebEx and everyone who's helped to set this up. Um, and we'll see you all in, or many of you in Stockholm, either physically or remotely. Thank you, Bernard. everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.